Welcome to today's science conversation at NTNU. The webinar series covers different aspects relevant for research careers and uh, research excellence. And today we'll talk about the role of the PhD supervisor. At NTNU we have close to 2,800 PhD candidates. The PhD candidates represent our largest resource for conducting high quality research. So of course, the PhD careers are important for NTNU, but they are also very important for the individual PhD candidates. And the supervisor plays an important role in the PhD study. And with me here today, I have two professors that are supervising PhD candidates. Meet Espen Storli and Tord Arne Johansen. Thank you. Thank you. Espen, could you please tell us a bit about your field of research and your role as a supervisor? Yes, I can do that. Um, I'm a professor of, of modern history. I work at the Department of Modern History and Society. And I'm, to be honest, I'm really just starting out as a PhD supervisor. I have two PhD candidates. So I'm, I'm still learning the ropes, and, uh, so to say. But I, I have uh, supervised more than 40 MA students, so I do have quite a bit of experience from that side, at least. And in our supervision, we, we think of it as a collective task in many ways, where we try to, to use the strength of the groups as, as a total in how we approach the supervision, so that it's not an individual or a privatized um, activity, but something that we, we try to think of more as a, a collective activity. Okay, thanks. And what about you, Torana? Well, I'm a professor in uh, automatic control robotics at the uh, Department of Engineering Cybernetics. And um, my research topics have changed quite a lot over the years. Uh, right now, I'm mostly working on autonomous ships, drones, uh, small satellites. And uh, I have um, evolved quite a lot. I started out, like Espen, with a small group of a couple of PhD students. And uh, right now, I have ended up with about uh, 20 PhD students that I'm the main supervisor for, plus also a bunch that I'm co-supervising. So your fields of research are quite different. Uh, Espen, how do you think that the, the field itself affects uh, the role of the supervisor? I think there will be, be very large differences between the different fields across the, the different well, subfields of, of academia. Uh, in some fields, there is more of a tradition of being this, this lone reacher, researcher sitting on yourself, uh, sitting alone in your chamber for three years or four years and then coming out with something definitive. While in other fields, I think there's a much more collective culture. You know that you're working together in a big group, that you're a cog in a larger machinery where you're working together, for instance, in, in labs or with more, more practical aspects of research. So uh, traditionally, I think there are really large differences between those fields. And, and my field has usually been this more individual, yeah, you go out alone into archives, uh, you delve deep into the sources, and then you come up with something hopefully brilliant after three or four years. Um, but we are trying to, to think a bit more differently about this, even from our humanities perspectives, and also to, to see how it can benefit the PhD candidates to also feel that they are part of something bigger. And how about your field, uh, Turana? Yeah, I mean, we have absolutely been through the, the same uh, evolution. Uh, I think some years ago it was uh, more common to have your own topic and, and do it yourself and don't interact too much. But uh, the trend is definitely that we have uh, teams that work together. They're trying to address the bigger problems that uh, nobody can uh, solve by themselves. and. Uh, it's, it's in, in IT, it's a, it's a, it's a fast-evolving uh, field by itself. So if, if you want to make a difference in the world, you, you, you don't really have a big chance to do it by yourself. So you, you depend on your uh, team and getting a critical mass. And that, that 
definitely influences the way uh, we, we supervise. Um, I, I, I like to think of the organization around me at the department and the collaborators as a, as a matrix organization where we, we can always find people that, that have the, 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 the competence we need either within the department at other departments or with industry or, or internationally. And we, we, we set up the, the, um, the, the supervisory team and match the PhD with other PhDs to, to try to get the best out of it. So you're thinking in the same way then? Yeah, more and more actually. Um, because I, I guess many have the experience that writing a PhD can be quite a, a lonely endeavor. And it's important to, um, to lodge it within a bigger group, I think, to, or, or not necessarily a research group as such, but a, a bigger academic environment where you feel that you're part of something bigger. So even though you're working on, on your specific topic, you might also feel that you belong to something bigger. And that's something that we're trying to develop in, in, in different ways. So we do have a, a research group, which is quite cohesive with a number of, of PhD students, quite large number of PhD students to be in history, uh, where there's traditionally fewer, fewer PhD candidates. But we also try to broaden it to include the rest of the department to have joint uh, events where we, uh, we can um, present our research or discuss uh, chapter drafts from the different PhD candidates. Okay, but so when we talk about uh, numbers, you, you have quite a large group uh, of PhD candidates I mean, compared to almost any supervisor. Uh, how has your role as supervisor changed, do you, uh, do you feel, since the very beginning? Oh, it's changed a lot. I mean, uh, in the beginning, I did a lot of research myself and the PhDs, they did, uh, you know, research in very much the same topics as me, so we were kind of doing the research together. Now I'm, uh, I'm more, uh, let's say, a facilitator or a, a initiator or tr trying to follow them and help them and uh, get the resources they need and set the direction, make sure quality is good, find collaborators. So it's, uh, and it's, it's a lot of projects, project management, because our projects are usually with, uh, with industry, with different uh, partners, so that there's also a lot of other stakeholders uh, around the PhD candidate. And what about you, Espen? How do you think that the group size affects the, the supervision? Well, it gives some opportunities when you have more people working on similar, well, similar wish topics mm. and you have the opportunity to have some joint sessions uh, so that also helps and it also helps to have other permanently employed staff involved in that supervision capacity so how we think about supervision is, is usually in three different layers so uh, usually I have informal supervisory meetings with my PhD candidates where we do have perhaps a set agenda, but it's more open to discuss sort of more the, the general issues and uh, as a way to establish trust and, and cooperation. But we can also include, for instance, postdocs, where they also can, can share their experience. And I think that's always helpful for the PhDs to hear from the people who have advanced one more stage, but are still not at the, at the well, permanent uh, position stage. So that's the, the formal informal supervision and then we have more formal supervisory meetings where the candidate usually will present chapter drafts so we discuss what has been been written and, and talk about you know, the strategy for for the future where to go what to do and then in addition we have these group seminars where the phd candidates at two or three times a year all hand in chapter drafts that we meet together usually have a, a good lunch together and then we go through the different uh, drafts and give feedback. And also where the PhD candidates get the experience of giving feedback to the other PhD candidates, which is also important to learn the ropes of how to, to read other people's text. And I think that's also a way to develop their career, because if they want to, to continue in this industry, uh, they would really you know also have to, have to read chapters from other people. So we have these main three activities that we, we try to use the group size and the department size to, to do something collectively together. 
So even though you are a small group uh, in itself, it is possible to sort of create an environment for, uh, for supervision. Uh, yes, I, I believe that's, yeah. that's the case. And even though the projects might not be very similar or they might uh, belong to different subfields of history, there's no problem in finding a common ground where you can have meaningful discussions across those subfield divisions. Mm. I, I think this um, informal supervision is, is really important and it, it's uh, also a responsibility to kind of create uh, this environment. And uh, my experience is that once you get enough uh, PhD students within a related area, they start kind of supervising uh, each other. And especially if you have, let's say, generations of PhD students where the coming new ones, they, they, they transfer the, um, the knowledge and the, the culture and the routines and the uh, experience uh, to, to each other. And, and uh, for us, we, we work a lot with uh, field experiments and with equipment, with robots, with drones. And, and it's, it's a challenge to kind of transfer knowledge from one PhD student to the, to the other. So having this overlap and this informal environment where they they meet and talk about their research and everything is, is, is really uh, essential. Yeah, creating this, this cultural cohesive unit is, is really important and also mm. using the, well, the PhDs themselves um, functioning as uh, conduits of uh, transferring culture from one generation of PhDs to the next is really important. Mm. And also I think they can, can help each other quite a lot with, for instance, practical things about how do you approach a, a conference, what do you think about when you give a presentation, uh, and they can serve as, um, as a friendly listeners when, when other candidates present things, which is also important to, to get that uh, sort of uh, positive feedback. But how about, uh, I guess there are also other stakeholders in this, uh, for instance, in your field uh, um, of research, I guess there are a lot of industry collaborations. How do they fit into the picture? Um, it, I guess it depends. Uh, in, in, in a few cases, they are more, uh, they take a more formal role, but quite often they are very keen to, to work uh, closely with us. Of course, they, they, have, uh, they have expectations. I mean, they, they are, uh, investing their time and sometimes money in, into the projects and then they're looking to, to get uh, to learn something or to get something out of it. So in a way you, you lose a bit of freedom on your, uh, on your research topic, but that, that, that's something you know from day one and you need to kind of accept. And uh, for me, it's, uh, I, I don't feel it actually like that, but I feel it the opposite. I, I feel, um, kind of honored when industry comes and want to involve us and uh, that we can actually learn a lot from them about uh, what are the real problems to, to solve. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this uh, industry collaboration is, is really, really fruitful, although it can be uh, demanding to, 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 um, to in kind of match all the expectations that are, uh, that are out there sometimes. Mm -hmm. Do you have industry collaboration or perhaps or collaboration with, uh, with external parties? How do you do that at your, at your field? Well, it's not as common as it is in, in your field, but it, it does happen in history, especially around uh, commissioned histories. So for instance, a big company might have an anniversary coming up. And they, they want to have something produced and then they might uh, um, uh, put in some money also to have some PhDs to, to work on, on aspects of their history. And that's a, um, a really good opportunity also for us as historians to, to get into contact with different parts of society and, and to, to get a very privileged inside look at, at different institutions or, or industries. Mm. So in, in the last 10, 15 years, there's been a couple of these larger projects where historians have really had a really good cooperation with larger industries. So I have been involved, for instance, in a, uh, a large project on the history of Statoil, Equinor, who will have the 50 year anniversary in 2022. Um, so we've had access to the internal archives and also access to the people working in, in the company 
to be able to talk to them and to, to figure out what has happened and, and how this very important company has developed. So there are, there are some possibilities also for, for external stakeholders to, to be involved. And um, it's something that we probably should, should try to do even more of. Every year, hundreds of new PhD candidates start their careers at Antinu. I have talked to one who started three months ago. In this video, we'll show you a bit from the conversation. Here is Wilde Johansen. Yeah, we, during one of our first meetings uh, with uh, all the supervisors and myself, yeah, we, we started the conversation with a fixed form that we uh, by ourselves went through to kind of um, get the opportunity to to also get a bit conscious about what we believe ourselves and what we kind of uh, want in each other. Um, and then we discuss it together to kind of see if we're on the same page and if there are different things that we might be, um, that we might disagree on, then we kind of discuss it and came up with a solution that fits uh, all the four of us. Because I also usually talk to a lot of other PhD students, um, the availability of the supervisor is quite important, especially in the start where you uh, you feel quite lost and you don't know what you're doing at this point. Um, that you have a supervisor that is easy to, to, to get in contact with is quite important. At the start, when you do this interdisciplinary work, it can be a bit confusing. Uh, and uh, because you have so so different perspectives on the same topic and different angles to actually view the problem itself. And then you have the, the issue or the difficulty to also kind of find your place in that disciplinary work. So how do, how do psychology fit into that uh, project? Expectations. Uh, Wilde talks about expectations and the importance of matching them and a bit about their methods for doing so. Uh, how do you work with that as a supervisor, Espen? Well, I think first of all it's important to, to establish a, a position of trust where you can talk openly to the candidate and the candidate feels that he or she can talk openly to you about what they want to achieve and how to achieve it. And I think one of the main roles of supervisor is also to to, to convey what is the expectations towards the final work and also how to reach that goal towards the end of the stage because you're not supposed, to, well, it's a learning process which can be, be, be challenging and, and difficult but uh, it's also about trying to, to show a way for the candidate how to reach that, that end goal and to, to meet their own expectations of what they want to achieve with this, with this position. Uh, what about you, Torana? Do you have like a, a specific form, or how do you work with uh, with the, the PhD candidate and the other supervisors to to mm. discover this? Uh, I don't think we have a special magic way to do it, but uh, I very much agree with what um, Espen says. And, and and this for me, this uh, is one of the key points already during the recruitment and especially during the, the interview to to kind of understand what are the the expectations and uh, why do you want to do a PhD? What kind of career are you looking for? Where do you see yourself in five, 10, 20 years? So we can uh, understand that. It's, um, and, and it's also something to, to, to follow up um, many times because this can, uh, these things can, uh, can change. And, and one of the things that um, uh, Wilde brought up was this uh, about uh, interdisciplinary uh, work, which uh, requires um, a bigger team. Um, and myself, I have students that have supervisors in uh, in IT, in marine biology, and uh, 
uh, ocean engineering and, and maybe space technology all, all at the same time. And people talk uh, different language. And uh, a supervisor, uh, uh, part of the job is also to kind of translate. And um, so you talk about the same thing. And then it's uh, easier to match the, match the expectations. Um. So we've established that it's uh, important to match the expectations in the beginning, but they might, might change during the PhD period. Um, I guess you have seen many examples of that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, th there could be um, many reasons uh, for that. I mean, it, it, sometimes people start with a problem that is uh, maybe it's too hard, maybe it's, it's mission impossible, and they, they start with something that. It is it's a dead end, and um, of course that that, uh, that gives um, a, a challenge with respect to the expectations. So one has to take a take a, a, a step back, and uh, uh, sometimes we we have projects that depend on others, like um, some equipment, some experiment, something that's out there, and, and suddenly it's not there anymore, and we, we have to shift the focus maybe from something practical to something more theoretical or, or something. So this is something that happens all the time. And every time it's different. So one just has to find a way to deal with it. Um, it's important to take it seriously, because uh, expectations are uh, very important for the motivation of the candidate. And the really big problems comes when the, the candidate starts to feel uh, less motivated about uh, his or her work. And expectations is also uh, sort of, we have expectations towards our candidates and what the, we want them to achieve. Yeah. But I, I think it's even more important to talk about the expectations that the candidate has towards him or herself, mm -hmm. which can at times to be very high. And I think it's the role of supervisor to try to, to tell them that you don't have to be brilliant in everything you do all the time. Mm -hmm. It's OK to, to take your time and, and to fail and to figure things out uh, along the way. Um, because we'll get there in the end, but mm -hmm. you don't need to be a fully developed researcher already in year one or year two. And, and this also comes, um, becomes very visible once you start to, to publish in, 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 in a journal and, and you get uh, the, the reviews, uh, which can be quite tough sometimes. I mean, reviewers can be, you know, e evil per persons that uh, uh, maybe is, can sound too harsh uh, than, than they really want to do. But uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it can be qu quite tough. And, and then again, it's, uh, it's important to, to kind of match the, the work with the, the, the right journal. I mean, you don't necessarily want to go for the, the best journal with your first publication. And th there's a lot of things you can do to, to kind of smooth out uh, the, 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 the way to, towards the PhD. We have gotten a question from the audience on this uh, topic. I'll read it here. Sometimes we hire a PhD or postdoc who is motivated, but after starting his or her job, he or she lost motivation. What should we do? Aspen, do you have any thoughts on that? That's always a, a <laughs> difficult question because there are many reasons why you could use, lose motivation. It could be related to, to the work environment, but it could also be related to, to personal issues. You know, life goes on, even though you're a researcher, you, you still have a life outside. And, and, and I, I think that the first thing to, be, to do is actually to figure out you know, what is the problem and, and, and try to, to talk with the candidate about what kind of shifts can we make to make this function a bit more? Or is the problem outside of, of what is going on at, at the university, but perhaps the candidate will need somebody just to, to talk about some other issues with and, and then, yeah. So it's, it, no, it's a difficult question. And I think it will vary about, well, according to, to where the problem actually lies. Uh, we have gotten another question. Um, that uh, involves the sort of uh, external um, issues. What should we do when the PhD candidate gets a child and either the PhD candidate does not have the right to a paid leave to take care of the child or moves away from Trondheim in the middle of the PhD study? What could we do? 
Have you experienced something like that? Uh, not exactly that. Uh, I had a lot of PhD students that had their childs, but I, I'm a bit surprised that uh, I would think NTNU would have a kind of a responsibility to to, to, to support uh, during that uh, phase. So uh, I, th I think the, my first reaction would be to talk to the HR people at NTNU and try to figure out how, how can we support, how can we provide more funding or whatever is, uh, is necessary. Um, but again, as, uh, in, as in the previous case, th there could be a lot of reasons why this, uh, this happens. So, uh, I think the key is to, you know, have uh, openness and trust and, and talk about what, what is, what is the real problem. Why, why does uh, moving out of uh, Trondheim uh, happen and, and, and take it from, from there? M maybe it's not a problem. Maybe, maybe it's just uh, needs to work in a different way. So. Uh, all PhD candidates are different and they have different goals and different needs uh, and many things can clearly be discussed and, uh, and communicated. But I mean, as a PhD supervisor, how proficient do you need to be as sort of a, a reader of persons uh, to, to be a good supervisor? Well, I think, first of all, all PhD candidates are different and need different things. And it's not always clear to, I think, a supervisor what they need or how they need it. So, so one important first step, of course, is to have an, an open line of communication. But I think it also helps to have some experience. Um, I, I think it helps that I've supervised quite a lot of MA students and I know that they will need different things and different kinds of feedback. So that also helps, but I, I guess you, you have, um, having been through this quite a lot more than I have, will actually have, have experienced much more than I have. Mm. No, but I, I, I agree with you. They, they, they're all very different, and you have to learn to learn to know them and, and figure out what do they need. And uh, their needs will quite often also change during the, the period. Uh, uh, in, in, in the, I mean, most or in, in all cases, it's important with a, with a good start. So you, you need to invest more time into supervision in the, in the start. But then there could be periods where they, uh, they would perform better if they are kind of left alone for a while. I, uh, I, I, I ask most of my PhD students if they, they know themselves good enough to, to know if they work best under pressure or in, in freedom. And, uh, yeah, they, they have different answer, and it, it's uh, it, it's it's up to us to kind of provide uh, an environment where they can uh, you know blossom and, uh, and and get the best out of themselves. And um, yeah, there are many ways to do that. Mm. I would like to take us back to something else that Vilda talked about: the interdisciplinarity that you also mentioned. Uh, Vilda talked about some of the challenges with interdisciplinary projects and sort of finding your role there as a PhD candidate and, and understanding the, the other fields of research. Uh, what is your experience as a supervisor in interdisciplinary projects? Well, our projects have, have mainly been historical projects, so they are much more aligned to, to one way of doing research. I, I guess the most issues that we had with interdisciplinarity is really to have recruited student PhD candidates with a different background mm -hmm. and then trying to, to teach them what are the expectations within history. Um, and I, I think that's, that's a process that takes time because you are trained at something and then you have to, to learn the ropes or, or understand how a different field works. And again, I think it is important to to have an environment where they also can observe how other peoples are doing it. And then to sort of themselves also find out how this actually works. But I guess you have, uh, have a bigger groups centered around is interdisciplinary research projects. Yeah, I, I think most people find it very, very rewarding to, to work in, on an interdisciplinary uh, problem. And I, I think 
people learn a lot from it. Uh, it it's also not only about uh, the research, but it, it's also about you know communication. How do you communicate with people outside your your own field and and, and make that collaboration uh, work? That that that, uh, that doesn't happen by itself. It, it requires quite a lot of uh, effort. Um, but but there, are, there are there are challenges, and 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 one of them is uh, like you say when you recruit a student that comes from a from a different uh, background, and um, uh, or if you have a student from your own background but will work closely with in another field, uh, th th there are uh, some uh, let's say limitations in in the in the rules of, of the the PhD program that. Uh, uh, I would say are obstacles there, and, and one of them is that uh, you're required to take three PhD courses, which uh, might be a bit of a challenge when you actually need more basic courses in a, in a different discipline to be able to to be able to communicate and, and work in, a, in an interdisciplinary way. So that, that's uh, something I've been trying to struggle against for ten years, but I haven't succeeded yet. So maybe somebody <laughs> listens today. <laughs> Uh, the other thing is on um, publications because um, most journals that we use they are within one discipline and, and it can be hard to find the right journal to publish interdisciplinary uh, work, especially if it's in a let's say a non-traditional uh, field. So, so some interdisciplinary fields like uh, oceanography or they, they have established uh, journals, but if, if you are working between two fields that are kind of unconventional, you are kind of lost, and it's, it's not obvious that journals from one field will accept or, or easily accept this interdisciplinary um, work. But uh, I think that the world is moving very much forward there, and interdisciplinary is becoming more and more important and more and more uh, acknowledged as, uh, as something important in itself. But uh, as a supervisor, you in an interdisciplinary project, you would need to know a lot more then or different things. Well, the only thing you should know is that there are a lot of things you don't know. So <laughs> you need to find uh, the co-supervisors and the team and uh, the resources to, to make this work. But are there challenges when working with interdisciplinary project that there are different expectations from different fields? Oh yeah, absolutely. So and one how needs do you to solve that? yeah, no, uh, one needs time to uh, to talk together and get real interdisciplinary collaboration uh, starting. So, and, and this should happen before you actually hire a PhD student. You should prepare the grounds and at least understand that yourself is able to communicate with the, with the people in the in, in the other fields and um, and, and build up, uh, let's say. Um, a common understanding of the, of the problems and a common language and, um, and take it from there. Mm. Um, I will take it to the last point that uh, Wilde commented upon, the availability of the supervisor. How is it possible to find that balance between being available as much as possible for the PhD candidates and actually having time to do your own work or the other part of your work? Do you have any comments on that? Yes, I, I think that's always a challenge because there are a lot of responsibilities and things that you need to get done. So one way of answering that is, of course, you need to, to, to clear your calendar and, and be very, um, very um, clear about your priorities, that if you take on a PhD candidate, you actually have a priority to, to take care of, of that person's development and career. But on the other hand, the candidate also needs to grow and develop. And mm. especially at stages of, of the project, I think they need time to, 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 to try things out more on their own and perhaps uh, approach other people and, and get feedback from them. From them. So it, um, I think it's, it's a common struggle. And I think most PhDs would would uh, have a say on this, but there are, um, yeah, it, it's, um, it's, you have to balance things there, I think. I guess that with P uh, 20 PhD candidates, your calendar is uh, quite
quite full. Yes, it is, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a priority. And the uh, most important thing is that uh, the PhD candidates should not be afraid to ask. I mean, worst thing is to say, okay, I, I don't have time right now, but you, maybe you can talk to that person or this person. And so I try to have a, a, a fast response time and give them some answer. It could be a yes or a no or one, one sentence rather quickly, but, uh, and, and then find time to go into depth when that's, that, that, that's necessary. In the first video, um, you met a new PhD candidate. I've also talked to a PhD candidate at the other end, uh, end of the range. Um, in this video, you'll meet uh, Christian Schultz, who just finished his PhD degree. I'm in the Department of Biotechnology and Food Science at uh, the NV faculty. And uh, the group we, we have is quite big, so we are nine PhDs, less postdocs, and around 15, 20 master students. And most of these people, or well, all of them are working actually in, in modeling and computational models as well. My supervisor has this philosophy that he basically asks already in the, in the, um, the candidates in the uh, interview, like, what would you do if you get stuck? And sooner or later, everybody will get stuck. There's, well, I've, I've never heard of a PhD or a project itself where every, when everything went smooth and there was no problems. So already at the interview, he asked people like, what, what do they do? And I think I answered like, yeah, I think I would go fishing, like try to clean the head or something like that. Um, but he then already said like, uh, what about a side project? Getting something else, making something else where you can get your head free, like lose the focus on the, on the other project and do something entirely else. Um, when, I, when I moved to, to Norway from, from Germany, I was used to call my professor Herr Professor or uh, Herr Studienrat or well, whatever kind of title you have there. And it's like a large jump in hierarchy. You have to basically earn to say the, well, you in German, uh, well, you in English and you in English is the same, but like there's the personal you and the polite you, uh, which we have in German. So it's, it's always the polite you. And, um, then you come to Norway and it's like uh, your supervisor says, hi, I'm Ivan. It's like, wait, what? That was uh, kind of a shock in the start, I guess. I mean, that could have gone forever, but there's some time where you just have to say, this is enough for being published. Because, I mean, this also depends, right? If you want to aim for nature, you would potentially need like one or two more experiments than if you would uh, aim not for nature. Um, so not only asking the research question, but also actually asking where do you want to publish the research? Where should it go? It's like a thing that should be discussed early on and because you actually would potentially perform additional or additional, um, potential different or additional experiments uh, if you aim for a different kind of journal or research publication. And the research question itself could potentially also change on uh, afterwards, but it's still very important to say, okay, now we have enough, we need to ship it. Because uh, this also goes back then basically to, to the time management. Most PhDs have only three or four years of time, uh, including some teaching potentially, and we need to make, or the supervisor needs to make sure that they are able to get enough in this within this time frame. And uh, saying this, no, that's good enough uh, is, is uh, I think easier for a supervisor than for a PhD themselves because it's your project, it's your baby, you're working on it and you're like, but oh, this is also cool, this is all I want to also. The supervisor needs to, boom, enough. You will get stuck at some point. Uh, is this something you discussed with your candidates early on, Torana? Uh, it's definitely true. I most get uh, more or less uh, stuck. Uh, it, it's kind of a trade-off. Sometimes I discuss it early, but it, it's also important not to kind of uh, s scare them or you know <laughs> to t take the problem before it uh, arises. Uh, but but um, yeah, at, at some point um, one uh, typically goes to some kind of not crisis, but but, but something that, that that is a challenge and it needs to be solved and. I think it's always good to know for the PhD candidates that uh, th this is common, this is, happens to everybody and 
one always finds some solutions. So one can, you know, sleep well and, uh, you know, work on the, on the solution. Um. I'm not, I don't think we have the time to follow up all the issues that uh, Christian uh, raised in his uh, video, but um, we got the question from the audience concerning what we talked about prior to the video. Uh, and I'll direct that to you, Torana. Uh, what can the PhD candidate do if the supervisor is too busy to answer emails, even to decline meetings or forward consultations? Well, uh... <laughs> I, th I think that's a kind of a serious problem that uh, he or she should bring on to maybe the call supervisors or uh, have a serious conversation with the, with the, with the, with the supervisor because uh, it's, um, well, th th there could be good, re good reasons for that. It could be that the supervisor has all sorts of problems on his own, and it, but for sure, it, it, take that problem seriously. Uh, but then, uh, what of the situations where uh, the PhD supervisor and the, the, the nearest leader of the supervisor is the same person? Have you uh, had an experience with that, Despen? Because they will have a, a conflict of interests. That's true. Luckily, I haven't been in that position. So, uh, but, but I can see that that could be a challenge, especially if the the relationship between the supervisor and the supervisee uh, goes through a, a difficult period because th the question be, would be then who would you approach to to try to solve this uh, so I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm i'm a bit unsure how to answer that actually i, I think the, the the formal way to do it is to move uh, upwards in the hierarchy talk to the boss of your boss or uh, sideways uh, to to somebody that uh, is a trusted person, maybe uh, representing the all, all the PhD students, or uh, is kind of the the vice uh, head or vice dean for uh, for for research and uh, education. Um, at our faculty, we, we have. Um, uh, annual reviews where uh, both the PhD candidate and the supervisor fills in forms uh, where we evaluate uh, what is going on and if there is some concerns or mismatch or something it, it's something that will be brought to the uh, attention of the, the head of the department but of course that, that happens on, on, only once per year so uh, I think if there are issues that they need to be solved, uh, solved quickly so yeah, I think the advice is to find find a person to to talk to somebody you can trust and that uh, is uh, sufficiently independent. Uh, there's another question here. Uh, Espen has mentioned the importance of getting feedback in your PhD and also learning how to give fe give feedback. How much of the feedback share that a PhD candidate receives comes from supervisors? And how much is expected from other sources like conferences, peers, etc.? Do you have any thought on that? I haven't got the percentage point, but of course, as a supervisor, I'm from a tradition where, where the text itself is sort of the main thing, mm. not just uh, the results, but also how you describe and, 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 and narrate the text. So, so that's the heavy importance of the supervisor. Uh, so I think there will be differences between different fields, but it's always good to get second and third and fourth opinions and to get opinions not just from the people who are very close to you, but people who might have a bit more of a, a distance and, and a broader perspective. But um, it, it's difficult to, to say in each specific instance how much should come from the supervisor and how much should come from, from other sources. But, but I do think it's important to seek out those other sources. Um, another question, uh, I'll uh, um, ask you to answer that, Turane. If a PhD student is more interested to do numeric or analytic calculations, but the supervisor project is mostly analytic, how should we deal? Should we change our project direction because of students' desires? 
I, I would say the, the answer depends a bit. <laughs> but uh, of course, the, the, there could be other stakeholders. It could be part of a project, others that depend on the results. And that, that could make it uh, more difficult. But uh, in, in my head, the, 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 the main outcome of, um, of a PhD is the PhD candidate itself. Uh, it's not like uh, it, the PhD candidate is kind of a slave that will do the, the research on behalf of the supervisor to get the, the results that the supervisor uh, expects. So that, that, that I guess, give, gives some uh, guidelines that we should try to keep the PhD candidates motivated and work on something that uh, interests them. And if there is a mismatch, uh, I guess a lesson learned is that things like that should have been clarified during the interview. And, uh, uh, sold as early, early as possible b before it uh, becomes um, a problem. We are approaching the end. Um, Espen, do you have any take home messages for PhD supervisors? Well, that's a good question. I think one take home message is to involve the uh, the environment around you in in your supervision i think that's uh, a good way of approaching it not to treat it as a sort of a private relationship but a, a re relationship between the whole village and and the candidate uh, so to to uh, make sure that the phd candidate is part of of a bigger academic home hmm. how about you Turana? do you have any um take home messages for either PhD supervisors or candidates? Yeah, I think maybe I just want to repeat what I said a couple of times, and that, that is that uh, the motivation is key. And uh, when one fin finds out that the PhD is, uh, is not a walk in the park, uh, one then should go back and figure out uh, what motivates and uh, uh, how can uh, problem be adapted, how can we kind of move forward in, 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 in a smooth way so we, because th there is always a solution. So, uh, yeah. So, no answer fits all, but there is always a solution. So how you supervise PhD candidates is affected by who you are as a person, who the PhD candidate is as a person, the team around you, the project, et cetera, et cetera. But becoming aware of and communicating expectations from the very beginning seems to be an important place to start, regardless. There are also practical tools available for you as PhD supervisors. And if you want to learn more, there are also uh, supervisor seminars at regular intervals. You can find more information about this on the uh, Science Conversations webpage. I hope to see you here at the next Science Conversation at NTNU on the 3rd of June, where we'll talk about how to build a strong project portfolio. And in the meantime, keep the conversations going. Thank you. <laughs>